Welcome. Uh, glad that you are joining us for our video podcast. Now, if you're someone who wants the full service, who wants welcome and announcements, wants prayers, wants music, you want to go back to the YouTube page and click on the link that says full service. For those of you that are like, listen, I just kind of want the message. This is the place for you. A chance for us to learn more about how do we live our life with Jesus in the midst of all of life. And so we're glad that you are joining us. If you want to find out more information, go to our website and check it out and click on whatever links most interest you. We're so glad that you're joining us. We look forward to continuing to connect with you and engage with you. If you have questions, if if you have suggestions, if you have things you'd like to ask us about, the best person to connect with is Leah. She is the one who would love to connect with you online in a way to help you grow in your faith wherever you are at. Well, thanks for joining us. Let's jump into this week's teaching. Welcome. Uh, great that you're joining us uh, this week. Um, for myself personally, it's uh, it's great to be back uh, with you. If you're watching last week, uh, you heard me mention in uh, the welcome that I was going to be away in Malawi. Uh, I had a chance to go back and to spend uh, 10 days there. Um, some of you may know, some of you may not know. Um, I work at the church here in Paris about 75% of the time, and then 25% of the time, I work in prison ministry in Malawi. Uh, my family have lived there on two different occasions for a total of four years. And so it's great to be able to go back and to be a part of it. And I just look forward to uh, sharing um, just some of the pictures and, and just, again, some of, the, some of the things that I'm engaged in while I am over there. Uh, if you're not familiar with Malawi, Malawi is in the southern part of Africa. It's a, it's a very small landlocked uh, country um, surrounded by uh, Tanzania, um, by uh, Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe. We just kind of give you the uh, the geographical feel for it. Um, 80% of Malawians are subsistence farmers. Um, Malawi every year is one ranked one of the top 10 poorest countries in the world. And so you can just imagine many of the challenges, many of the struggles. Well, for me, uh, my involvement is in the prisons in Malawi. And you can imagine if the circumstances in, um, in Malawi are difficult, they are so much more difficult in the prisons. I mean, they're overcrowded. Uh, they are uh, underfunded. And it has been amazing to see the opportunities that I believe God has given to me to make a difference in the lives of men and women in the prisons in Malawi. But before I get into that, I want to land on this question of, do you believe that God can use you to make a difference? Because I think a lot of the times we may go through life, we may be involved in a church, we may, we may have a faith, but we don't get to the place of realizing that, that one of the great and amazing things is that God wants to use you to make a difference. Maybe you're in a place of thinking, well, you know what, I'm too young or I'm too old or, or I don't have the gifts or I don't have the abilities or you know, I, haven't, I, I haven't gone away to school, I don't, I don't have the education of some. For others, it might be a place of like, listen, uh, I'm just too busy. Like, could God ever use me? And this is one of the most important things I believe that we can learn. That if we really want to understand God, uh, develop a relationship with him, that we land at a place of recognizing how God wants to use you to make a difference. And so we've been using this series the last number of weeks on encounters with God in unexpected places. And I want to jump into another encounter of Jesus that he has in the midst of a massive crowd with uh, an obstacle in the way, and he talks to two specific people, his disciples, as to how to help him out. And so we're going to jump back into the story, got to unpack it real quick, and then talk about what does this look like for us in our lives. And I'm going to use my example of being involved in the prison ministry in uh, Malawi as, as an example. And so the situation is this. It's, it's early on in Jesus' ministry, and he has been performing miracles. And when you start to perform miracles, you begin to draw attention to yourself. And so, and so people are starting to follow Jesus. And, and it's here that we're going to jump in. It's, it's in John chapter 6, and we actually find Jesus on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And so John 6, this is what we read. It says, After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went, because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. 
Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus saw a huge crowd of people coming, looking for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the 12 barley loaves. It's, it's right here that we see an amazing miracle. And sometimes one of the problems when we read the Bible or we read these stories of Jesus is we jump to the end and think, wow, that is amazing. But like, what difference does it make in my life? I, I believe this is one of the best examples of how Jesus wants to use you to make a difference. There's, there's some real subtleties in the midst of it. One of the first things we learn from this story is how God values partnership. Have you ever noticed that when you read the Bible, that, that whenever God is going to do something, he immediately begins to look around to see who can I partner with. And, and this was exactly the case with Jesus. He's teaching, he's performing miracles, suddenly this massive crowd is getting closer and closer. Now, we often think of it as 5,000, but that's just the men. So there would have been women, would have been children. So we're looking at tens of thousands of people and they haven't eaten all day. And you know what happens when you don't eat? You get grumpy, you get a little angry, you get a little annoyed. And Jesus is like, we gotta feed these people. And what I love is that Jesus didn't just suddenly say, well, okay, another miracle, I'm gonna feed them all. No, he turns to Philip and he says something interesting. He says, where shall we find bread for all these people? Notice he didn't push his disciples aside and say, listen, I've got this. I'll take care of it. No, 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 no. He says, where shall we? He didn't say, Philip, you figure it out. And then I love the little add-on that, that the Bible tells us. It says, Jesus was doing this to test him, for he already knew what he was going to do. See, see Jesus already had a plan. You see, I believe that God wants to use you to make a difference because God values partnership. And it's not just that like God can get things done, because let's be honest, if God wanted to get the things done that needed to be done in this world, it would be way more efficient if he just did it on his own. I mean, I mean, why would Jesus turn to Philip and like let him babble along and try to make up an excuse? He could just sort it out himself because there's something more significant going on. I remember when my kids were younger, uh, one of the traditions we'd have is on um, Saturday mornings, uh, we, I'd get up and make pancakes and waffles. And there was a time when, when they were little, they wanted to help out. And at first glance, I always thought, I'm not so sure this is such a good idea because it's going to be messier. It's going to take longer and not all the right ingredients are going to get in at the same time. And so they're not going to be as delicious. But of course I had them help me out. Why? Because it wasn't just about the finished product. It was about building relationship. Have you ever considered that, that, that when God like nudges you to step out and to do something to make a difference, it's not just about the finished product. It's about partnership, about building relationship. Which reminds me of the second thing, because when Jesus turns to Philip and is like, where shall we find bread to feed all these people? I love what Philip does. He, he's like, listen, eight months wages could not buy enough bread to feed all these people. Basically, he was trying to find a polite way to tell Jesus, listen, it can't be done. But fortunately, Andrew comes along. And, and Andrew almost like, he must have overheard the conversation. And he probably remembers that all these people are gathering around Jesus because he has just done some amazing things. And so maybe Jesus was going to do something else. And, and I want to get in on this. And so he finds this boy with a lunch. Like, Think of a McDonald's Happy Meal, like a filet of fish and an order of fries. Like that would be a modern day context. And he brings it to Jesus and he's like, but what can this do amongst so many? 
I think one of the valuable lessons we learned that if we want to make a difference, we look at obstacles as becoming opportunities. I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I'm faced with obstacles, one of the first things that I do is I pray. And oftentimes my prayer goes a little bit like this. Jesus, please sort this out. Thank you, amen, right? And I kind of leave it with him. And then when the problem doesn't get sorted, the obstacle's not overcome, almost like, God, like what, what are you doing? Like why, why, why are you not sorting out my problem? But have you ever considered that sometimes our prayers should act more like a boomerang? You know what a boomerang, you know, you, you fire it out and then it comes back to you. Maybe sometimes unanswered prayers or prayers that haven't been answered yet is God's way of partnering with us, of bringing our requests back to ourselves, of saying, listen, listen, I've got a plan, but will you see this obstacle as an opportunity? Will you step up and will you join me? Because then we see something amazing, that after Andrew gave Jesus this boy's lunch. Jesus took it, he blessed it, and they distributed it amongst everyone. And I love the detail of the story because we're told that everyone ate and there was leftovers. So it's not like people showing up to a potluck and realizing that there's less food than people and so I'm just gonna take a little. No, no, everyone helped themselves. There was, there was absolutely more than what was needed. Which brings us to, to the final thought is that no gift is insignificant when placed in the hands of Jesus. I think sometimes we feel that we fail to step out in faith and respond to the nudges because we think that anything that we could do would be insignificant or we don't see the obstacles as becoming opportunities. I don't know your circumstance, I don't know your situation, but I know this, God wants to use you to make a difference. God wants to partner with you, not to just get stuff done, but to build his relationship with you. And, and, and one of the ways that our faith grows is by stepping out to the nudges and beginning to see what God wants to do with us. So, back to the prison ministry in Malawi. I would say in many ways, this is one of the places where I have seen my relationship with God grow. I have seen my faith continue to grow. You see, it all started with a nudge. Actually, two specific nudges. The, the first one came in, in about 2005. I was living there with, with, with Rebecca, um, and then we adopted Isaac, and then Masika. But I was involved in a church that every Sunday would send elders to go and do a service at the local prison. And for some reason, I was never asked to go. And so one day I said, like, listen, hey, can I go to this prison? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. And so I remember walking into this prison and being with them. And there was almost like this nudge come over me where I was like, listen, I can't be here every week on a Sunday, but if there's anything else that I can do, please, please let me know. In a matter of days, the inmates had, had made, uh, uh, written a letter and give it to one of the prison guards who brought it and delivered it to me at the church. And in the letter they said how they had not have a, had, had a minister visit them in over two years. And they said, if you could just come any day of the week and teach us the Bible, we would love that. And so that was the first nudge. That was in 2005. And I started going to one prison and teaching the Bible. Well, fast forward a, a number of years, we, we moved back to Paris and the, the, the prison ministry in Malawi just kind of continued to, to move along a little bit. And in 2015, I was given an opportunity to go back with my family to Malawi for, for one year. Uh, our national church was asking us to kind of look for opportunities for us to continue to partner. And so one of the things that was still sort of on the edge was this prison ministry. And so I have to admit, a little reluctantly, I went back into it and we started visiting now in two prisons. Well, about partway through my time, one of the um, team members, one of the volunteers came to me. His name was Rami. And he's like, Abusa, Abusa, which means a pastor in Chichewa. He says, listen, listen, um, why don't we start visiting more prisons? 
Now, I get it, I get it. I, at first glance, that seems like a really, really good idea, but here's the problem. Most of the prisons in Malawi, in our region, were in the rural areas, like a couple hours away. You needed, you needed a sturdy vehicle to get there. Now, I had, a, I had a truck, but when I returned back to Canada, the truck would be sold and it would be no more. And I remember seeing this obstacle and I turned to Rami and I'm like, listen, Rami, uh, I'm not so sure this is a good idea. Like, is this really gonna work? And I remember him looking me in the eye with a bit of a smile and saying, Joel, why don't we try and see what God is going to do? Well, I mean, hey, like, how do you, how do you, how do you argue with that? And so we went from two prisons to four prisons. And it has been amazing to see what God has continued to do. Since 2017 or 16, I have returned back to Canada. The last five years, we have seen this ministry grow and grow and grow through a dedicated group of volunteers. We are now involved with 17 prisons, 12 male and five female. That's about 2,800 men and women every single week. The ministry basically falls under the tagline of Friends of Prisons, planting seeds of hope. And, and we do two primary things. Uh, the first one is what I refer to as the ministry of presence. And it's basically going and providing Bible study weekly. Just doing Bible study, praying with these men and women, just doing one-on-one -on -one counseling as we are able. Uh, second thing we do is we provide basic necessities every month, like medicine, uh, clothing, uh, soap, shoes, whatever is needed. And it has been amazing to see how individuals have continued to provide for these needs. As I think of the fish and the loaves, I've seen how I've had this experience in my life, how through a little nudge, through a little invitation through other people, God has partnered with me and others to make a tremendous difference. But it's not to say we haven't faced obstacles. Particularly in the last couple of years, we have faced a number of obstacles because of COVID. One of the first problems we had was we could no longer use public transit to get into the prisons because of COVID. Public transit was shut down. And so we started thinking, well, what, what are we going to do? Well, God had provided generous funding through donors so that we were able to fix up one of our volunteers' pickup trucks. So now we have our own vehicle. It's, it's an absolute beauty. I, I call it vintage. It's, it's Rami's vehicle. He, he loves it. Not a single distribution was missed through all of COVID. Second major obstacle we faced was during COVID, they literally shut down the prisons. And so we were no longer allowed access for about 18 months to go into the prisons to provide Bible study. Well, guess what? One of our team members saw this as an obstacle that would become an opportunity. So they began to handwrite Bible studies, photocopy them, and distribute them in the prisons. And so you know what began to happen? Instead of us just going in the prisons and having an hour and a half every week, now these were given to the inmates themselves, and they started doing Bible study among themselves. Just seeing some incredible things happening. You know, so often we can be like Philip, can't we? We, we can see the difficulties, we can see the obstacles, and we can begin to think, what could we possibly do? Listen, it, it's been so exciting for me to be able to be back in Malawi, to, to see our team members, to, to see what God continues to do in these prisons. And I was reminded yet again that no gift is insignificant when placed in the hands of Jesus. This last year, has many, in many ways, has been our most fruitful year in prison ministry. Uh, because of the, the impact of the Bible studies, we're, we're actually now rolling out a, a, a new training program where we are providing training and education for some of the inmates so that they can become our Bible study leaders while in the prisons. We actually had one individual who was recently released from the prisons join our visiting team. So imagine, imagine after having spent years in prison, he's now choosing to go back into the prisons in order to tell others about God's love for them. Like talk about transformation. And, and when it comes to financial generosity, this has been the most generous year we've ever had. Uh, the church in Paris has been amazing. 
in, in 2021 alone, around $18,000 was given to support this ministry. It, it was so good to be back. It was so good to see the impact that was being had. It was so good for me to be reminded again that God values partnership, that oftentimes obstacles become opportunities, and that no gift, no gift, is insignificant when placed in the hands of Jesus. So let me ask you, when it comes to your circumstances, do you want to be like Andrew? Or do you want to be like Philip? Because both were placed in a similar circumstance, in a similar situation, but they had a very different response. You see, I believe oftentimes some of the greatest encounters with God begins with a nudge, begins with something that, that we might easily ignore. But when we step into it, we begin to see not only what God is going to do through us, but what God is going to do in us. So where are you at? Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your neighborhood. Maybe it's within this church. Where is God nudging you to step out in faith, to make a difference, and in doing so, you, you not only impact the lives of others, you'll see the impact that God wants to have upon you. So listen to the nudge and step out in faith. Let me, let me pray for us as we conclude. And so Jesus, I just, I just thank you first of all that you are the God of miracles. That you can often take little things, simple things, and do incredible things. I thank you for the work that you're doing in Malawi and just the opportunities that we continue to see happening because of it. But I pray for those that are watching. I know they're in circumstances and situations that I may not understand or know, but God, you do. Jesus, I would ask that, that they would be open to your nudge, that, that they would see perhaps their obstacles in front of them as an opportunity to partner with you in incredible ways. And Jesus, may we be reminded that, that no matter what we give, it's never insignificant because we give it to you. And so it's in Jesus, your name, we ask all these things. Amen. And so now may, now may the blessing and love of God, the Father Almighty, the, the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the peace and the comfort of the Holy Spirit not only be with you, but nudge you to take a step of faith and then see what God is going to do. Have a great rest of your week.